Thank you, worship team. Philippians chapter 2. It's uh, written in your handout if you'd like to follow along or open up your cell phone app or if you have your own Bible here, Philippians 2. I'd like to read verses 25 to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He's a true brother, co-worker, fellow soldier, and he is your messenger to help me in my need. I am sending him because he has been longing to see you, and he was very distressed that you heard he was ill. And he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him and also on me so that I would not have one sorrow after another. So I am all the more anxious to send him back to you, for I know you will be glad to see him. And then I will not be so worried about you. Welcome him with Christian love and with great joy and give him the honor that people like him deserve. For he risked his life for the work of Christ and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. Oh, Father, would you open these words to our hearts? Help us to put ourselves into this story and hear from you by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Epaphroditus, isn't that a great name? <laughs> I don't know if, if I was at the age where I could still have kids. And maybe I'd think about that as a name on my list. Great name. He's a risk-taking hero of faith. <laughs> you know, there are things about ourselves that we cannot learn by ourselves. We need other people. We need friends. We need teammates. We need family. We need heroes and mentors and models who show us what it looks like to walk by faith. We need, that's why it's so crucial that we pick our role models and our heroes and our friends carefully. Because what we do naturally, without even thinking about it, sociologists call it an urge to merge. Where we see in somebody else something that we would aspire to be, something that we would want to see in our own lives, something we would like to be like. We, we see that, maybe even subconsciously, and we're not aware of it, but we see that, and, and we want to be a little bit like them in that way, the urge to, to merge. So it's crucial that we pick the right people to hang around and to be the kind of role models that uh, others are looking to. You know, one of the things I love about our church family is that I really believe that we have the potential, that God is raising us up as, as a family, a family of believers. We have the potential to raise up heroes of faith, mentors and role models that younger people and other people can look up to, to see. That's what it looks like to journey by faith. That's what it looks like to be a person who loves Jesus. Role models. And so here's a question for you. Who is watching you? Because if you think about it, somebody is watching you. They might not even be aware of it. You might not even be aware of it. It might be a young person. It might be a friend. It might be a co-worker. Somebody, maybe even without knowing it, sees in you something they would like to see in themselves. And they're looking to you. As they might not even call it this, but you're kind of a role model for them of what it looks like to be a person of joy. Faith, hope, and love. Give that some thought and some prayer as we enter into this next year. Be aware of the people around us that might be aspiring to be something that God has put in us. So as we enter into this next passage that we just read this morning, just a little background there. Remember, Paul's in prison, and the Philippians had taken up an offering and they sent it through Epaphroditus to get to Paul. And they also told Epaphroditus to, to stay and, you know, serve Paul in his needs. You know, you'd have to take care of somebody that's in prison. It was expected that friends or somebody would be there to take care of their needs. And so Epaphroditus is sent by this Philippian group of believers to do what they couldn't do, to go where they couldn't go to serve the missionary Paul. And so he... Epaphroditus is like a missionary sent by the Philippian church 
to go and, and minister to Paul, to go and do what they couldn't do. And by the way, we still do that. We still have missionaries that we support and we send to places that we can't go to do things that we can't do and we support them and we pray for them. We're, we're a part of a missions bigger family, a global family in the Christian Missionary Alliance. And so I am really excited to send some of the gift. You know, if you missed uh, Christmas Eve service, all, the, uh, all that was put in the black box, uh, we're, we're giving that away to local benevolence and to mission. So if, if you missed that and still want to participate, you can do that to help, you know, do this thing of supporting those missionaries who have gone to do kind of like what Epaphroditus did for Paul. Take the message of the gospel and to serve him. So Epaphroditus, we don't know a whole lot about him. Now there's some things that we can ascertain about him and guess about him. We know that they would have sent a godly servant kind of leader. They would have sent somebody that's representing them, somebody that's representing this Philippian church. We could guess that he was a man with a heart of a servant. He's like a deacon, a servant kind of leader. They sent him, they picked him to go and serve Paul. We can we can guess that he was a man of great courage. He took a risk. He was willing to take the ship of his life and journey to a distant place he had not been to before. A, a risky thing to do. So he was a risk taker. Other than that, we don't know much about Epaphroditus. But Paul gives him four really significant titles that we can you know, learn some things from and, and draw some things from that make Epaphroditus like a role model and a mentor and a hero to us. Four titles that are given to Epaphroditus that I would hope that we would aspire to be like. To, these would be qualities in our life as we think about what Paul said about Epaphroditus and these titles that he gave him. So consider that with me. First of all, Paul calls him a true brother. A true, now, now that's a, a term of endearment. It's a very spiritual relationship kind of a term, very personal. And brother and sister, isn't that what we want to be in the family of God in, in the church? If God is your, if Jesus is your savior, then God is your father, and you and I are brothers and sisters. And by the way, in our midst, we have some female Epaphroditus. So don't make this a male and female thing. We have some real role models and mentors and heroes of faith in this room. People that are being raised up by God to, to reach out to others in the context of community and a, and a family. Jesus said it this way in Mark chapter 3, verses 34 and 35. They, somebody said to him, hey, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. And he said, here are my mother and brothers and sisters. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. We're a family. And so this title that Paul gives Epaphroditus is a very relational, spiritual, family title. Brother. We are brothers and sisters in the family of God. It's, it's something that marks us. It's a quality that we would aspire to have more of in our lives. And you can think about what all of that means, being a, a family in faith with Jesus. Keep in mind the context of all of chapter 2. There's been this kind of thing of community. In community, we're growing as followers of Jesus. One in faith, one in family, one together. You know, in that light, you know, family takes care of each other, right? And family sticks up for each other. I, I have to reveal to you that even this past week and the past month, I would say, one of the most enjoyable things that I've been able to participate in is some positive gossip <laughs> about you. Your names come up, and it is so fun to say positive things about you. I, I just love doing that. I hope you do, too, because family does that. We stick up for each other. We don't always get along and agree on everything completely. You know, we're a family, and sometimes there are disagreements, and sometimes we rub each other wrong, and sometimes it's hard to be in a family. But when we're talking about each other behind your back, I would hope you're encouraged by the fact that it is positive gossip going on. 
that good things are being, we stick up for each other, especially when you're not around. And by the way, if you're ever in that setting where you walk into a conversation and you know what that's like, maybe it goes quiet for a minute because they're not sure you would participate in talking about this person they're talking about and the way that they're talking about. If, if you walk into a conversation like that, well, there's a chance to be a hero. Step up and bring something positive into that conversation. And you may not say this with your words, but in our minds we're thinking, hey, that's my brother you're talking about. That's my sister you're talking about. Hey, did you know this? And you can flip that completely into a positive moment and even a moment of prayer for that person because family sticks up for each other. We care about each other. And so we're brothers and sisters who watch out for each other. Hebrews 10, 25, don't give up meeting together. Why? Encourage one another. We encourage each other. It's one of the things that we want to do even in gatherings like this. When we come to, together to worship, the primary focus is to worship Jesus who's worthy of it all. But in this, we do it together and it's a time to encourage each other. I love the fact that we're a church family that sometimes we have to really try to get everybody's attention because they're out there in the welcome area loving on each other. And some of you stay for a while after just to, you know, you know this. We encourage each other. It's so encouraging to be together and to say positive things about each other. So Paul calls him brother. And another title that Paul gives Epaphroditus, he says he's a co-worker. He's a fellow worker. And so he's referring to the unity of the work that they're doing together. They're one in work, fellowship and work, brother to brother, face to face, shoulder to shoulder. They, their hearts beat as one for the cause they love. They're co-workers. They're fellow workers on mission together. And that's often what holds us together. We're, we're on mission for Jesus. We're co-workers. We're fellow workers together. You know, we, we've talked several times now about role models that God gives us in the scriptures. People who are like mentors for us, heroes of the faith that we can aspire to be like. It's like the biblical principles that we see in the Bible. God gives us role models of that. People who put flesh and bones to the biblical principles. And so we've, we've talked about Paul, who's a great role model and hero of the faith, but he's, for most of us, for me at least, he seems way up there. It's like, man, who, I could never be Paul. And we talked about Timothy. You know, Timothy was a role model. He's still a little bit, you know, but Epaphroditus is like the common person's hero. If Paul hadn't said something about him in this passage, he'd be unknown. We wouldn't even know about him. He's like the model, role model for the common person. He's achievable for us to aspire to be like him, Epaphroditus, to be a brother, to be a co-worker with others. Epaphroditus brings a whole new category of heroes, people who are just under the radar. Some of you are heroes of the faith who are doing things behind the scenes and under the radar that nobody even knows about. You might be doing something in the workplace that nobody realizes. You're praying for this person and seeking to build a bridge to this person to bring the gospel to them. The rest of us aren't even aware of what God's using you for in that context. Some of you are working with kids and doing other things where you, you, know, you don't get even recognized or, or celebrated by the church family because it's under the radar, but you are a hero of the faith. We work together on mission. And what you're doing, whatever that would be, it's no less significant than the Pauls or the Timothys or the Epaphroditus's of biblical times. Maybe you're setting up for the worship service beforehand and nobody even realizes that. You're setting up the coffee bar and you're, you're sticking around afterwards to help clean that up and nobody even notices. But God does. And you're a hero. You're a role model of what it looks like to just be faithful we're all on mission together and we all have a part. We are co-workers together for the kingdom. And whatever we are doing, whatever it would be that we're participating in, we have this responsibility to manifest what Christ is like and to show, be a role model of faith in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Whatever context, 
we find ourselves. We're co-workers together. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. Co-workers together on mission for Jesus. So Paul calls Epaphroditus a family term, brother. He calls him co-worker. There's another great term that he uses for Epaphroditus. Fellow shoulder, fellow soldiers. We're shoulder to shoulder as soldiers in the, the kingdom. You know, you know, these are great titles, aren't they? Brother, co-worker, fellow soldier. Those are awesome titles that I would hope we would aspire to have those kind of characteristics in our own lives, to manifest those kind of qualities. The sad thing is, sometimes in Christian circles, that's not natural. It's not the norm. We, we can tend to distrust each other. We can, we can tend to rub each other wrongly. Some, sometimes we, we don't feel like we are co-workers and, and team players together. But I think we're the kind of church family that is really good at celebrating each other and affirming each other and agreeing to disagree and loving each other no matter what. Affirming what God sees in you and helping to bring that out. So in that context, that's how heroes of the faith and role models and mentors of the faith are raised up. In a context of family where we're brothers and sisters and co-workers together and fellow soldiers in the kingdom, on mission together. Shoulder to shoulder soldiers. Together with Jesus as our commanding officer. If you've trusted Jesus as your savior, you, you've been called into a battle. It's good to be reminded of that sometimes. There is a kingdom of darkness. And we are called to be soldiers of the light. To bring light into our world. You know, I've, I've met so many people, maybe you have too, that, that claim to be you know, that they believe in Jesus, but they're not part of a church community of, of faith. And I'm always a little bit, my heart gets heavy in those, in those kind of conversations because what that means is if we're not a part of a community, if we're not part of a family and engaged in that and actively participating in that, then we're kind of out there on our own. We're not called to be in battle alone. I have some friends that, you know, we lived in Montana for a while and so those that are getting to know me, you know I'm a, I'm a hunter. I, I love hunting. I love the wilderness. I, I just love being outside. And this area that we used to hunt in Montana that was really famous for mule deer, mule deer bucks that were just massive. They had these huge antlers. and Not that we were just antler hunting, but it's fun to see them and be out there in this these big, massive mule deer and, and elk as well. But a couple of my friends that live there now, the wolves and the mountain lions have gotten out of control in some areas. And they were telling me that in some areas, those big massive mule deer bucks are just not there anymore. They're getting killed. And some of the big bull elk are even getting killed. And you would think, well, wait a minute. They're the ones that are strong. They're watchful. They, you know, they, they have all those, those antlers. How can they be the ones that are getting taken out? Because they leave the herd and go out on their own. Their isolation is their peril. They're not in a herd where there's lots of ears and eyes watching their backs. So they're the ones that are getting taken out by the, the wolves and the mountain lions. Boy, is that appropriate for us? To be encouraged. To be around people that we're getting to know and getting connected with so that we're supporting each other and helping each other and praying for each other and lifting each other up and, and watching our backs together. We're fellow soldiers in a war. And the battle is over the souls and lives of people. And God calls us into that to help other people get drawn into the kingdom where they have a spiritual family where there's protection and, and support. We're in a war. There's the enemy who does not want to see that happen. As I think about 2023, I'm thinking, I want to hear some stories of victory where people are brought out of the darkness and into the light because of the work that you are doing. Hallelujah. I think God has great things ahead for us as a church family. And so as soldiers, there's unity in the battle. There's one purpose, one mission in serving our king. And we have fellowship in this fight together, knowing that the victory has already been won. Jesus has already conquered everything. He's conquered death. He forgives us for our sins when we come to him. There's great victory 
ahead, and we are soldiers of the light. Remember chapter 2, verse 15, that we are like lights shining in the universe as we hold on to the word of life. So we're pressing on together as a team, as fellow soldiers. There's a fourth title that Paul gives Epaphroditus. He's a brother, he's a co-worker, he's a fellow soldier, and he's called a messenger. A risk-taking messenger, by the way, because there's unity in the message that we bear. And Epaphroditus is, is a man on mission, and it's not just that he you know, has a mission, he embodies a mission. He is the mission, taking Jesus and serving Paul and taking the gospel forward. And he's willing to take a risk in that. You know, we see in verse 25 of this passage that he's sent to take care of Paul's needs. Really, really he was sent, one biblical term that you might use for that, he was, he was sent like as a, as a deacon. If you remember Acts chapter 6, when we went through the, the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 6, it, the early church came to the point where the apostles were starting to neglect the ministry of the prayer and, word, and the word, and so they appointed the deacons to help serve the needs of the people. And they had to be spirit-filled. There were these qualifications. But they appointed these spirit-filled people to take care, the deacons, to take care of the physical needs of the people. And, and there were many in those settings. So that word deacon was, um, it, it really comes from a compound Greek word that means stir up the dust, which is really cool. Because you get this picture of these people who are so diligent and so active and so intentional about doing their duties and helping people and serving people, they're doing that so much that they kick up the dust around their feet. That's the image that comes with that. They're very intentional, diligent about serving. So Aphroditus models that for us, discharging his duties as a servant in such a way that he like kicks up the dust and takes a risk. And so he was sent as a deacon and also with an offering. And you can read about that in, in Philippians chapter 4 if you want to peek ahead. Some of you have read the whole book already several times, which is great. In Philippians chapter 4, uh, Paul says in 419 that, you know, my God will meet all of your needs according to his riches and glory. And the context of that is that the Philippians had given so generously that they left themselves in need. And Epaphroditus was the one that brought this offering to Paul. And so they had given which is risky to give in such a way that you leave yourself in need. And, and it's part of what Epaphroditus embodies. He was a risk taker. He was a giver. And he's representing a church that was a risk-taking, faith-filled group of people. And they sent Epaphroditus to represent him. Because even for us, giving is risky. Giving of our time, our talents, or our treasures, or whatever it is we have to offer, it's risky to put ourselves out there and give. It catalyzes faith when we do so. And Epaphroditus embodies that. So notice something that I think is profound here in, in verse 25. It says that Epaphroditus longs for all of you and he's distressed because you heard he was ill. Think about that. Why was Epaphroditus stressed out? He was under stress. He was stressed out because they had heard that he was ill. He wasn't stressed out about his own situation or his own circumstances. He was stressed because they had heard that he was stressed. So he was stressed about them being sad about his not feeling great. Think about that. When was the last time that you got stressed out because somebody had heard that things weren't going really well for you and something? Not about your situation, but about them knowing it and it was going to cause them sadness. That's kind of a whole new level of concern for other people, isn't it? I mean, he's feeling bad. They're feeling bad about his feeling bad. So he's feeling badder because they know he's feeling bad and they feel bad. He feels bad. Everybody feels bad. Why? Because central to the faith is relationships. They're concerned for each other. And so Paul's like saying, I'll send him to you so you can see him, so you can be overjoyed to see he's okay. He's filled with joy even in his circumstances. We care about each other. Relationships are so crucial. Something else there too. Why was Epaphroditus sick? You might ask that question. Did he catch COVID or what? What's going on with, 
with Baphroditus. That word sick, the original word there is ostineo, which is not like sick sick, like not like he had the flu. It was a word that puts a lot of background behind that. He, it was related to his work. He had worked so hard in the cause of Christ that he risked his life. He put himself in danger and kind of like worked himself almost to death. That's taking a risk. He stuck his neck out. He risked everything to work hard. He stirred up so much dust that it made him sick. That's why he was sick. Because he was working so hard and brought on his own weaknesses, but God in his grace took care of him. And that's the point why Paul wants to send him to the Philippians so that they can see. Yeah, he almost died, but, but he's a representative of victory, that God has mercy and grace. And we can continue to work for the cause of Christ, no matter how risky it gets. I mean, he was a risk taker, literally. He gambled his life. You know, all of us take risks, don't we? I mean, why do people bungee jump? Why do people go parachuting? Why do people do some of the things that they do? Because I think God built us with the desire to take risks. You know, that adrenaline rush, whatever it is. We are wired to be people who are able to take risks what sets biblical heroes and mentors apart is that we're willing to take risks on behalf of others. That's what Epaphroditus models. He was concerned about others, and he was willing to risk his life for others. That's a genuine mentor of faith. I want to be like that. I want to aspire for that, don't you? To carry and live a message that points to the power of God at work in my life. So they call each other brothers and sisters and fellow workers and fellow soldiers and they love one another even though there was risk involved and I hope that's us as a church family. That we put Jesus on display, that we make Jesus famous, that we show the power of the Spirit at work in us, making us more and more like Jesus that we are mentors of faith simply because we're living by faith. We're living the message we so deeply believe. And then as Jesus expressed it, others look at us, and as, as expressed in John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples. If we love one another, we live this out. We call each other brothers and sisters and fellow workers and fellow soldiers and messengers together on mission out of love because of what Jesus did for us. So we're going to participate in communion in a moment, but a couple questions you might reflect on even as we do so and help walk this out into this, this new year. Where do you need to take a risk? There's a question. Where might God be inviting you to just take a risk? Some of us might have been recently hurt so deeply that you're in that place where I don't think I'll ever trust anybody again. Is there somebody that God might have in your path even now that you would be willing to take a risk, trust them, and lean into a relationship and build something that God might want to use to repair your broken heart? That's risky. Maybe it's, uh, where is it for you that God might be inviting you to take a risk for this new year where you can actually take the risk and you know when you take a risk that's where the victories are so magnificent aren't they? You take a risk I bungee jump and I actually get back on the platform that was risky but man the victory of that. Wow the adrenaline rush of that it takes risks to bring those great victories. What is that for you? Where are you willing to risk it? Maybe it's something that you want to have victory over Maybe you want to have victory like we talked a couple weeks ago and I'm no longer am I going to be a recreational complainer. It's risky to choose to see the positive and to have positive conversations. Maybe it's risk in relationships or wherever it would be. What, what are you willing to do to take a risk in the power of the Spirit and to His glory? 
The other question that might be asked is, especially flowing out of verse 29, they're encouraged to welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him, it says. You almost get this like cheering culture going on. They're, cheer, they're encouraged to cheer for Epaphroditus, probably because that's what they already did. And so Paul's affirming that. You know what, what you do in cheering for each other? Extend to him a welcoming hand. You know, as I thought about this uh, this week, I thought about trying this, but it might have been a little bit overwhelming. But what if we were that kind of a church culture where we, we all knew that we had this welcoming, open hands toward each other all the time? What about if... Uh, what about if Pamela and Will walked through the front door for the worship service and all of us who are here ran over to them and was like, Will and Pamela, the entire day is completely different now because you are here. Oh, man, we celebrate you. Oh, we love you. You are just such amazing people. I can't believe that. I'm going to have a great day because you are here. I know that might be a little overwhelming. <laughs> but you get the spirit behind that? What if we had that kind of an attitude? Honestly, I, I do. When, I, when I'm out there in the welcome area and seeing people come, I really have that in my spirit. Oh, they're here. They came because they care about worshiping God. And what a great thing on the first day of this new year. They're, they're here to start with worship and prayer and being with their family. Oh, doesn't that do something? I think that's what Paul's talking about. Extending welcoming hands toward each other. Cheering for each other. In that culture, kind of a thing for a church family, we're raising up mentors and heroes of faith who celebrate each other. And by the way, we can have welcoming hands toward each other because Jesus had his hands nailed to a cross. So as we enter a little time of communion in these next moments... You know, the reason that we can be brothers and sisters and co-workers and fellow soldiers and messengers on mission is because Jesus is the mission. He is the message. We have the freedom to extend our hands to each other. God did everything we need at the cross. Every blessing of the believer flows through the cross. You know, we sang that song today, the reckless love of God. The first time I heard that song, I had a little hard time. What? The reckless love of God? How can we attribute to God anything that's like being reckless? How could that even be okay? And if you start to think about that, from our perspective, it would seem that God was pretty reckless with his love in doing what he did at the cross. Think about it. Think about taking a risk. Jesus went to a cross knowing that, you know, it was risky, wasn't it? It was quite possible that he could go to the extent of dying on a cross to show the depth of his love for us and nobody would respond. Nobody would love him back. That's what could have happened. And with God, Jesus knew that there would be people who would not respond and love him back. He died for the sins of the whole world, knowing that there would be people in that world who would not respond and love him back. That is risky. That seems reckless, but that is how much God loves us. That's the extent that he was willing to go. He created us with a will, and we get to choose and he wants us to choose to love him back. And so as we remember, I think it's a great thing to do on the first day of the year to remember why we can even celebrate. So I would encourage you to access the, the bread on the, the one side of, of your cup. And we, re, we remember that this is the body of Christ. If you just hold on to it for a moment and it would be kind of fun to take it all together at once, kind of a communion, union, unity kind of thing. But think about what this means. And I want to encourage us to just pray for a moment. And Father, in this moment, we remember this, this bread stands for the body of Christ broken for us 
So Lord, forgive us for the things that we've done. Forgive us for the things that we've failed to do. Forgive us for the things that we thought, said that were just not of you and just not right. We believe, as we remember, that Jesus, you went to a cross. You gave it all for us to be able to have forgiveness, that you died in our place so that we could have forgiveness of sin and have a relationship with a holy God. You make us righteous by your forgiveness because of your completed work at the cross. So we remember how profound that is and how deep your love is that expressed there. So in this moment, we confess we desperately need your forgiveness. Forgive us, Father. As we remember, as we take together, God, we receive your forgiveness. We receive your love. We receive you. I pray for anyone in, the, in listening that doesn't know Jesus as Savior, that even in this moment, that would happen. Jesus, I receive you and your forgiveness. And be my Lord and my God, as I remember what you gave for that to be able to happen in my life. And I say thank you. And thank you for what this means, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take together. And then Jesus, is what, at what's called the Last Supper before the cross, he took the cup and he said, this is a new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. We remember. And we remember that in, in the blood is life. Life that God has for us. Victories ahead in this new year that includes forgiveness for the things that we failed to do in the past. Victories ahead because of the blood of Jesus. Father, thank you for what this means. I pray that you would fill us with your power to be able to be mentors of faith, role models of faith for others to see. Not to lift ourselves up, to lift you up. Thank you for what you gave for that to happen. We remember that this is your, this is a symbol of your blood, a blood shed for forgiveness, cleansing, and new life, resurrected, empowered life for your glory. In Jesus' name, let's take together.